Hannah Vickers, I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. Uh, so welcome to your final webinar uh, in this series, uh, all focusing on navigating COVID-19. We've created this series to help our members and the wider industry uh, through the difficult and turbulent times we've had recently. Um, and this is the last one that we're going to do in this particular series. So we've had all sorts of um, advice and guidance on these webinars from uh, accessing the bank loans to understanding the furlough scheme. And really, we feel like we're coming to the end of the perhaps acute phase of this response um, and starting to, to look forward. So we've seen earlier this week um, the Prime Minister making his address to the nation on Sunday night. And then yesterday we had a bit more detail about how we're going to sort of slowly come out of this lockdown. So it's very timely and entirely by um, fluke, shall I say, we didn't know that this was going to be uh, timed for, for Boris's announcements, but very timely then that we are starting to now look at um, recovery for the construction sector. So this is something that, as you might imagine, uh, we've been talking about, it's been very topical um, on the Construction Leadership Council. So this is where you know, we all come together as business associations to discuss um, you know, what's been happening. We've been very active over the last a uh, few weeks in supporting the industry and now we're starting to turn our attentions to planning the recovery phase as a collective um, which is obviously the only way that's going to be truly effective so I'm really pleased that I've got two fantastic guests um, with us today which I shall introduce shortly but um, <clears throat> we've got Andy Mitchell who is the chair of the Construction Leadership Council and you might know him from his day job he has two jobs as the uh, chief exec of Tideway as well as if he wasn't uh, busy enough uh, and then to give a slightly um, different view to, to myself, we've got Alistair Reisner, who is the Chief Executive of the Civil Engineering Contractors Association. So we'll come to uh, introducing them and giving them a few minutes um, shortly. Um, but just to, to give you a bit of a, a feel for the session today, so um, we're going to have a bit of <clears throat> the different perspectives from, uh, from our guest speakers. I'm going to set out some thoughts um, that I've been collating up from, from my members and the consultancy part of the sector around what they think the priorities are uh, for recovery. And then we're going to leave a good sort of 20 minutes, half an hour for questions from yourselves. Um, so if we just to move to the, the next slide, we'll have a little bit of detail on some of the um, housekeeping. So if you haven't joined us for one of these before, you're very welcome. Although it's branded ACE, it's open to anybody. Um, in the sector who would find this interesting or useful. So whether you're my members or not, you're all very, very welcome. Um, if this, in terms of the question session, if you haven't joined us before, you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a sort of chat function where you can type your questions in. Um, you can type them at any point. You don't have to wait until we say questions. So please just keeping them, keep them coming in. Uh, and what will happen will be, I will field those and it can be to myself, it could be to Andy or it could be to Alistair. Um, in terms of who you'd like to, to ask the question of. But the idea is we get a bit of debate, a bit of feedback going, um, just to help you know, share some thoughts perhaps on, on what should be in recovery and how we, we move the sector forward uh, into that phase out of our sort of current kind of lockdown phase that, that we've been in most recently. Um, and the last point before we get started is just to say, don't worry if you miss anything, uh, if you miss anything on this, or actually if um, you, know, what, you want to share this with your colleagues, because we will record these and they're all available open source and free on the ACE website. So uh, if you've enjoyed it, if you want to share it um, with your colleagues, if you think there's real sort of nuggets of insight, which I'm sure there will be, I don't mean to, to play that down, but um, then, then you can do, you'll be able to just share the link. Um, and the same with our previous webinars. So, you know, there's a whole series there. The web link is at the bottom and we will circulate it to all of you who have attended today as well. Okay, so. Let's get started. Um, I'm just going to introduce our first guest. I've given him a little bit of a, um, an introduction already. And so Andy has really been our, our figurehead during the um, acute phase, the lockdown phase of the crisis. He's been leading um, the Construction Leadership Council and the task force that, that both Alistair and myself sit on um, to negotiate and support government and provide industry feedback into government. Um, so it makes sense, I think, to, to start with Andy as, a, as our leader to say, look, what you know your thoughts on on the recovery and the recovery phase should consist of and what the CRC's role is in that because clearly you've been central to this first phase um, how do we keep that momentum going behind the CLC moving moving forward as a single voice into government Andy okay thank thank you Hannah uh, good afternoon everybody um, so 
Okay, CLC. Yes, I've been co-chairing that now for uh, about 18 months or so. Um, and of course, I've been co-chairing that with, uh, well, now I'm co-chairing with Nadim Zahawi. Uh, and I think a, a number of people will have been on the uh, ministerial uh, discussions, broadcast calls that we've had every couple of weeks. And there's another one this week week as well. Um, CLC actually was was uh, set up um, about eight, uh, eight years ago. And you may, may recall the construction 2025 targets of 33%, uh, 50%, 50%, and 50% as they were uh, in terms of cost, time, environmental impact, and, uh, and exports. And and it was a CLC that uh, gave rise to the sector deal, and and we were sort of working our way through uh, what did what did sector deal two refer uh, mean, uh, and what should it comprise? And that really was all about planning the industry future. But then, of course, uh, COVID nineteen came along, and um, so, I mean, Hannah, a couple of things there. What one, um, Hannah said we've been meeting for a, a few weeks. We've been meeting for an hour plus every day for the past seven weeks with a, with a task force that I, I called together, which was representative uh, and, and trade bodies, including the, the ACE um, and SICA. Um, and actually, we've rattled through quite a lot. We, we did start off with the, the safe shutdown procedures and the site and branch operating procedures, working on the employment schemes, the furloughing, the JRS, uh, various the, the loan facilities that we're aware of, put out guidance on con, uh, contractual management uh, and dealing with the situation we're in and that was a, uh, jointly done with uh, with government huge amount of work done on product availability uh, the, the, the flow of cash and the flow of products being as crucial as they are became very apparent through this whole process um we, we put together a, a showcasing uh, piece in terms of uh, the, the good things that construction has been doing because we've not necessarily uh, been getting all the best press o over recent times. Um, there's some interesting stuff there. And of course, increasingly now talking about the, re the recovery plan. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, as a reflection, um, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, pandemic has, has been a horrible situation and, uh, you know, and the death toll uh, is slowing, but still increasing and, and it's horrendous all, all round. Um, it has had the effect, however, of galvanizing certainly this industry, in my view, and the level of uh, cooperation and collaboration and open discussion that, that I've seen through uh, all the task force sessions has been um, tr uh, very different, uh, if, if I can say that. And, you know, and I think with, with everything in life, you, you've got to deal with the challenges that come along, but you've got to also recognize the opportunities that come out of out of that and, and a key point for the whole industry is that we we've got to a different place in my view in terms of how we uh recognize that we have common problems uh and that together we can uh make sense of them and and that's a real point of keeping the momentum and the focus and and the the, the common intent to collaborate to to a better a better outcome uh, and that's what we've got to build on um <clears throat> When we, we talk about the, the recovery plan, and Hannah's going to talk about it a little bit later, uh, we, we, we're using the three uh, headings of restart, reset, and, and reinvent. And whilst we say typically restart, we're talking about the next uh, one to three months and reset the sort of three to 12, and then the reinvent uh, tw 12 months and, and beyond. I think it's really important to understand that these aren't sequential activities. There's stuff that we need to be getting on with now that relate to the reinvent phase and what could the industry be and how do we need to change it. And that, that's a really important point to understand. This isn't a case of we'll wait 12 months and then we'll worry about the, the reinvent piece. And, and so that there's I think the headings make sense. The restart, yes, just getting back up and running. And, and that that is happening. Uh, as, as we know, uh, the, the reset in terms of, well, what can we do to prime the future um, uh, and then the reinvent different ways. Um, what we shouldn't forget is that we, uh, the, the, the work streams that we had pre-COVID uh, under the headings of the, the digital manufacturing and, and life cycle performance piece, the procuring for better value 
um, component that's always been running, the skills piece, the building safety piece. Um, just before Christmas, we agreed that we should have right up front um, the, the building safety, the net zero carbon and, and, a, and a more common, consistent approach to health, safety and well-being. And, and nothing has changed there. Those, those still are the key components for a, a future better industry. One of the things that we we were getting to, and, and I think this process has accelerated, is understanding how better to dis, or to sectorize this industry, if you like. So we talk about economic infrastructure, which was where, where the sort of infrastructure client group that I used to chair uh, is. Um, we, we now recognize, uh, as going through the, the whole process of the past eight weeks, that, that housing is a very specific um sector as is the the rmi the, the domestic uh, repair um, maintenance piece um and then of course social infrastructure the sort of the the, the parallel to the economic infrastructure typically uh, publicly funded and then the private construction piece so you can see that under the three phases of restart reset reinvent uh and the key work streams of the digital the procuring the skills the Building safety, net zero, health, safety, well-being. You can you can see a matrix, therefore, coming up with the 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 sectors of the economic infrastructure, housing, RMI, social, and, and private construction. And the 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 trick for us now is to take the momentum uh, and the proven capability that we've got uh, when we work together to draw up that uh, the the recovery plan. Uh, under those sectors, against those work streams, there's a lot of detail in there, obviously. Uh, and a, re a real trick for us now is to understand now who, how do we, uh, how do we corral that? Uh, how do we set clear objectives for each of the meeting points of that uh, matrix of work streams and sectors? Um, and that's where a lot of the thought and, and, and effort is going into now. And the intent over the coming few weeks is to make sure that we're all comfortable with with how that matrix comes together, that we're comfortable with who's playing what role in it, uh, what are the objectives of each of these work streams uh, uh, and for each sector, such that um, I, I would hope by um, end, end of May, early June, as, as an industry, we've all got a common roadmap of where we now need to go because the challenges that we've had around building safety and net zero haven't gone away. The needs to implement digital off-site manufacturing haven't gone away, and a lot of these are clearly crossover. So um, it's all there to be had, um, and our trick is to uh, now go at that with the same level of intent uh, and cross-industry collaboration that we've seen in the past two months. And, I, and I've got to say, I, uh, from an industry point of view, I am more uh, hopeful and more positive about what we can achieve as an industry. And, and I think sort of things I'm hearing from, from, from government groups and, and other sectors is that the construction industry is really starting to look like uh, we're, we're joined up and we've got a, a coherence that, that people haven't, been, haven't seen before. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to believe that, um, that there's a lot of really positive stuff we can do. And I think that's the challenge that lies ahead of us. Final plug for Hannah, in, out of the task force sessions, Hannah has played an absolute blinder on a whole number of fronts, um, a, a really strong advocate for uh, the consulting uh, part of the business. Um, and just so that you know, um, we would not have achieved what we have without her input. So thank you for that, Hannah. Thank you very much, Andy. And then just to be clear, I haven't actually paid you to say that. So that was a very um, nice unsolicited feedback. So thank you. Um, and as you say that, you know, the, as we look forward, the, the sort of convening, um, coordinating and leadership role of the CRC is going to become um, increasing important, I feel, um, not just not just in our, the phase that we've just been in. So thank you for people starting to send their questions through. Heads up, Andy, we've got a few questions for you, but I'm just going to hand over to Alistair now to give um, his perspective on on what the priorities are for the contractors uh, during the um, recovery phase and then we'll we'll conclude it and, and, and come on to these questions so please do keep your questions coming in but Alistair what does it look like from your perspective 
So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll reinforce what Andy's just said there about Hannah's contribution to all of this, uh, a sterling representative of, of the consultants. Uh, so after that brown nosing, I will get into uh, what we think uh, the priorities for our members are around uh, the recovery plan. Um, it's clear that this has been an extraordinarily difficult period for anyone that's a supplier uh, in the construction sector and our members are uh, no different in that. So I think a lot of our focus at the minute is at the front end of the plan, the restart elements. Um, I think our guide where they can safely do so are very keen to get back to work. The old thing of, you know, if a shark stops swimming, it dies. Well, I think if the industry stops delivering, it very quickly gets into trouble. So the sooner they can be delivering at scale, uh, the better for them. However, I, I don't think that they want to do that uh, if they can't do so safely. So I think the initial priority for our members has been to try and understand what it means to get back on site and to do so safely. And I think where one of the real benefits that we've seen uh, of the CLC task group is that production of not just um, site operating procedures, but the spreading of good practice uh, so that people understand what they should be doing. I think the government guidance that came out yesterday is also extremely helpful in that. But I think we're still trying to button down some issues around transport, around PPE, around testing uh, for COVID-19. And all of these will play a role in giving people a comfort uh, around getting back to work. Um, the second big challenge is around cash, to be blunt. Um, there's a risk that companies will run out of runway before they get back to restarting uh, work as they just run out of cash to service their business. So I think we've seen some really good stuff there from clients uh, providing additional support to their suppliers. Obviously, there's the government loan schemes. I think there's a responsibility for industry around paying quickly their own supply chain. Um, so I think we need to do a bit of work on that. Uh, and the big thing that from our members we're seeing is uh, a request for some improved visibility around the pipeline uh, of future investment. So uh, it, it, where I think some work that we will be doing is trying to understand what that pipeline looks like. In fact, actually, it should be good. We were, prior to going to this, going to what we were uh, calling an infrastructure revolution. There's nothing to suggest that that isn't going to be the case, but any additional clarity we can see around that pipeline helps to sustain jobs because people will know that they're not holding on to employing people uh, just on the basis of the hope that there is some real uh, future investment to work against. Um, I would also highlight another couple of things that have happened that have made that transition back to restarting work um, more easy. Uh, it's the work that the CLC group has done around materials availability. That was a big challenge a couple of weeks ago that people didn't think that they weren't were going to be able to source the materials they needed to work. I'm not saying the problem's gone away, but certainly it has been mitigated to a great uh, extent. Uh, and also another props for, for Hannah, the work that's been done on um, how businesses can come off furlough has been incredibly helpful uh, in terms of making sure that pe where people are bringing people off furlough that's in a, in a managed uh, approach. So that's sort of looking at the, the, the restart, but I actually do think there's something almost a positive that we can look at, at on this um, in terms of the role that our industry can play. If we can get the stuff that I've talked about there right, I think our industry is in a better position to rebuild the recovery of the economy than other bits. You know, Historically, when we've talked about GDP, people have talked about services and manufacturing as being the big contributors uh, to uh, a gross domestic product. That's always still going to be the case. They are larger sectors. But actually, in terms of the one that's going to drive the growth, I think our sector can be that catalyst over the, the, the coming uh, weeks and months. So all the work that's been going together through CLC on this recovery plan has an importance beyond just construction. It's important to the UK as a whole. Um, and my final point on this is around um, I think something that Andy mentioned about, you know, construction is seeming more joined up uh, as, as a result of the work that we've done on COVID. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think it would be crazy for us to go back to a situation where industry reverted back into its silos. I think there's a real opportunity for us to reshape the, the way the industry works together. 
uh, as we go forward. So I think that probably captures some of our priorities around the, the recovery, um, but I'd be happy to have, uh, take, take any questions in relation to that. Brilliant, thank you, Alistair. No, and as you said, I mean, that's a really, really good summary, um, snapshot really of, of, of where the, the contracting um, community is. We are getting lots of questions, so um, hold your horses there. We shall, we shall come to those, but there are plenty coming in um, just around that, a little, you know, a little bit more detail. So um, thank you very much. I shall just take a few minutes now to, to add the perspective from the consultancy uh, part of the industry, and then we'll, we'll open up um, and I'll share some questions. Okay, so. I'll just try to, to bring together some of the um, some of the introduction that Andy gave us. So if I could have my first slide, please. OK, so part of this um, understanding the recovery plan is putting it in the context of wider, um, you know, what, wider recovery. And actually, particularly if we're going to be requesting government support, either through policy interventions or through funding or financing, um, as part of the recovery plan, we need to make a good case to them as to why to invest, so why us as a sector. So in terms of the um, consultancy part of the industry, and this is perhaps where uh, you know, Alistair and Andy have sort of said I've been a good advocate, it's because I've been really clear about actually, you know, consultancy might be small by, by value in terms of um, the industry, but the impact that we have can really affect an awful lot more than, than just our own businesses. Um, so, you know, we can see there was sort of the accelerator or the brake on the whole construction sector. So if, you know, if, if we're not working, there's no work in two years time for the, for the contractors to move on to. There's no work for the, you know, product manufacturers and the merchants to, to be providing uh, resources for. So, so it's very much getting clear about that, that narrative around prioritising um, some of the different uh, voices, if you like, in recovery. The economic recovery of the UK is obviously going to be um, central to the government's thinking uh, over the coming months. And again, there's more we can we can do um, in that space, I think, to, to sort of bang the drum for construction um, and particularly for consultancy, because actually our role is in that sort of upfront thinking. So if we know that you know, the, uh, the government is going to have constrained resources, they're going to have to have spent a lot on this uh, key phase of, of the sort of um, COVID response, actually by investing now, uh, and you'll see when we come to our recommendations, but by investing now in thinking and planning for the um, longer term investments, doing some of the business case appraisal, doing some of the outline design, doing some of the upfront planning um, over the next few months, it will give them much more confidence when they come to make those investments. Um, and again, you know, we've seen time after time the rush to get um, commitment to whole schemes announced before perhaps some of that upfront development has has happened. So this is a real opportunity if we can to turn this into a you know a, a sort of an opportunity to to reset that part of the industry. And lastly, actually, you know, as far as construction is concerned, we've got an awful lot of influence on the things the government really cares about. So Alistair touched on this. You know, they were quoting an infrastructure revolution, but they saw the infrastructure revolution being a vehicle to actually get us to net zero, to change how people travel, to, you know, to, to think about how people um, buy homes and, and things in a different way to get us to net zero. And then secondly, this levelling up agenda, which we know is going to be central to the recovery. Uh, so thinking again how the built environment plays its role in that. And you know, we're a domestic market by and large in construction. So if you pour money into, into us, it doesn't suddenly disappear offshore. Actually, you know, if we get the, the policy right with the government, it should go and encourage growth, both directly through the construction jobs, but also through the, the infrastructure and the built environment that we influence um, to create jobs locally across the UK. So we've got a lot going for us if we're pitching our, our case. Um, so we move to the, um, the next slide, which touches um, a bit on the themes that Andy was talking about, so the phases of the recovery. Uh, and this is where the CLC has been really important in giving us that framework. Um, so everything I'm going to take you through on these next few slides is about the consultancy input to that. Um, but we're working within a common framework so that we can be part of the, the CLC voice into government. Now, the three phases that, that Andy outlined there um, for us look like um, you know, mobilising during the restart phase. Now, for us, um, that is slightly different to the contractors, but we can take it as a common, as a common sort of um, theme uh, during the recovery. Um, for reset, we can think about how we need to evolve our ways of working. 
Uh, and that's both for the sort of short-term COVID resilience, knowing that social distancing is going to be around for quite some time, but also, you know, really trying to, to build on the construction sector deal and embed things in terms of long-term productivity of the industry and how we work. And then lastly, the reinvent phase, uh, which focuses on mostly on the external impacts. So what are we going to be doing during our recovery phase that is going to help the recovery of the overall um, economy and, and society? Um, actually, so so those are our sort of three phases, um, and I so said that's been been sort of uh, set by the Construction Leadership Council. And what we're into now, and what I'm going to take you through, and I shall caveat it heavily with these are thoughts um, and you know and ideas and feedback that we've had from our members, because the idea is as ACE and as Alistair just set out for Seeker, our role is to to work out what each of these uh, topics mean for our members, and then feed that in to the relevant parts of the CLC plan. Um, to make sure that the overarching recovery strategy works for all parts of the industry, but is put into government with one voice. Okay, so if we're moving on now to the to the next slide, I can just take you through um, for each of those um, topics what our, our ideas are at the moment. So I say that you know part of what I'm hoping to get out of today is to start to socialise these um, with yourselves on the call, uh, so that we can refine them and we can make sure that we're completely clear. So they're not. This is my polite way of saying they're not fully formed ideas yet. So they are just thoughts and priorities at this stage. So, so this is focused just on consultancy. But for restarts, we know, you know, um, we're very interested in the forward pipeline of work. You know, we need to understand what the pipeline of uh, planning and design and business case work looks like for the consultancy firms. You know, we are very people based businesses. We need to know that there's work for those people before we bring them back off of furlough so that we can make sure our businesses are the right size and the right shape um, for that forward pipeline of work. So we're, we're focusing on getting certainty on that. Uh, and in particular, at this stage, we know we can push for certainty on the public sector because it's in the government's interests, whereas some of the private sector's demands uh, might be a little bit more up in the air. But I'll come on to, to our thoughts around that. So for the public sector, we need to focus on getting clarity on the forward pipeline of work to give the businesses confidence. Uh, and we'll do that through trying to establish a, a dialogue with government uh, and ourselves. And then secondly, we need to look after our people. We need to think about evolving the furlough scheme. So we've already started, done a piece of work on that. And we're hoping that we shall have some positive news from Rishi Sunak later today around how the furlough scheme would evolve, taking on board some of our recommendations around flexibilities uh, and extending it beyond the end of June, such that it helps businesses to, to remobilize, if you like, uh, in a way that, um, that is perhaps more difficult when you've got people on 100% furlough and can't work at all. Within that, we're having very active conversations around apprentices. Um, we're very conscious that it would be quite easy for businesses to have a knee-jerk reaction uh, and cut um, their support for apprentices either already in their businesses or uh, in terms of their intake for, for September this year. So we're trying to, to look at solutions to that, look at support for businesses in that, recognising that actually we need this talent coming through and into the industry. Uh, and then lastly, just under talent retention, we're looking at um, trying to establish a bit better, for want of a better word, networking. Uh, between businesses and this could be in terms of lending whole teams, loaning whole teams between businesses um, but also even redeploying staff that might be made, being made redundant out of one business giving them an opportunity to go into a different part of the sector um, so that we don't lose the talent overall. So you know, recognising that there's going to be different parts of the um, sector that, that will speed up and slow down during this recovery phase. So, so that's our sort of thinking at the moment around consultancy priorities in restart. If we just move to um, the next slide, please. So then the reset phase, this is about trying to set up our, our ways of working um, so that we, you know, if we're going to be accelerating and, and, and getting a sort of bigger programme of work off the ground, this is about how we, how we do that in a better way uh, and a more resilient way to, to COVID than we might have had before this crisis. So there's two parts to this. The first one is all around the planning process itself. So I'm sure uh, any, any of you that, well, I'm sure all of you have had some inter interaction with the planning process during this period of lockdown with probably very differing 
um, differing experiences. We're hearing it's quite patchy. In some some um, planning authorities, they're being very very proactive. They're you know getting on with the job, recognising that they need to keep the planning system moving, operating remotely, doing um, public consultations. But that is not universal. So we think there is a piece of work to do there about streamlining and supporting the planning process, such that if social distancing is with us for the next you know, year and a half, two years, we can actually um, start to, you know, to, to continue to get the private sector developments and even the public sector projects through the planning process. It doesn't become a constraint on our recovery and on the pipeline. Uh, and then secondly, something which um, Andy touched on. So this is a piece of, of work that the CLC had in their program before um, we got into, I was saying into this mess, but into this, uh, into this situation where a focus on value-based appraisal and procurement, so making decisions, whether that's project-based decisions around which options to take forward, which projects to take forward to funds, um, all the way through to them being able to uh, actually procure on a value basis. So making those decisions, be it project decisions around appraisal or procurement decisions around how you go to market and who you appoint, on the basis of value, best value delivered, rather than lowest cost or cheapest option. Um, so the CLC has already got a work stream on this, and what we're looking at is how we can uh, build that out so that we get the industry business models to reflect it, so that it's in a position where we've got a framework that supports this, that works within the rules of the Green Book, that can be launched um, you know, later this year, so that we're not starting a whole pipeline of new work and doing it with the old you know, thinking around lowest cost, around cheapest option in the in the project business case. So those are the the two priorities for us under under reset. Uh, and then just lastly, if we come on to to reinvent um, the next slide, it's focusing on what we can do for the sort of pipeline over the medium term. And this very much starts to to touch a bit more on stimulating the private sector because we recognise in the short term from the conversations we've had with the private developers. They, you know, they, their confidence isn't there, but their visibility of demand is also not there. And that is unlikely to become clear in the next month, two months, it may be a few months out. So what we need to start thinking about with them is how we can put the right framework around them in terms of local recovery. Um, so something which would have been a viable development six months ago, in a brave new world where people are you know, more home-based, where people are traveling less, um, may not look like a viable development anymore, but equally things will go the other way. So there's going to be a sort of process of, of needing to kind of reappraise um, what cities and, and towns need, what their requirements are, and thinking about how the government policy um, interventions there can stimulate the right sort and support the right sort of private sector development. So that's something um, that we want to, to start looking at in detail. We think there's an awful lot of scope um, in this space. There's, you know, there's interesting things happening with the LEPs um, and the combined authorities around how they make their local recovery plans and the role of construction in that. Um, there's things already available like the town centre and the high street regeneration funds um, that could be expanded or altered um, to support that recovery. Um, and lastly, um, the point on here around the infrastructure finance review. Now that is one example of private finance, but we do recognise in these sort of city-based local recoveries that um, there's going to, to need to, to be a need to blend public sector funding with private sector finance and investments. And actually being able to provide different models of doing that. Now I'm not saying here we need to bring back PFI, but I do think there's going to need to be a recognition um, and some policy flexibility, shall we say, from the government in that space, because we simply aren't going to have enough public sector liquidity to be able to support everything that needs to happen during this kind of recovery, reinvent our sort of towns and city space. So, so that's, I think, a bit of a whistle-stop tour on, on the current thinking, and I will stress very much the current thinking. Um, I'm very open to, to sort of ongoing debate and feedback on these, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavour of, of what our, our, you know, the feedback is that we're getting from our members and the types of things that we're starting to, to scope up and feed through into the Construction Leadership Council around recovery. So um, just to, to, to move on now, I think we'll come, we've got lots of questions in, which is great. Um, so I think we'll just um, come on to the, the questions part now. We've got a good 25 minutes here, so um, do keep them coming in. Um, if I start with... Um, 
Andy, so we've got a question um, for yourself coming in around um, the CRC recovery plan and somebody asking, are there any silver linings? Do you see opportunities to accelerate necessary change as we move into recovery? Obviously, that was a big part of the CRC's priorities before we came into the um, pandemic. So perhaps you'd like to just comment on that, whether that priority has changed. No, thank you. So I, I, um, I, for sure, we've we, we've got to get out of where we are and the the, the restart reset, um, all, all part of that. And um, you know, to, to date, an awful lot of what CLC have been focusing on is very tactical. It was dealing with the immediate problems that we had, and whether they be site based um, or, or whether they um, they be cash and materials and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, for me, the, the reinvent piece um, is simply a, 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 restatement, a restatement of all the things that we knew we had to do anyway. But um, yeah, clouds do have silver linings and, and the prospect of making the, doing the right things, the things that we needed to do around the industry and, and they say that the, the whole digitizing uh, manufacturing piece, but the building safety net, net zero, these, these were enormous challenges. Um, that I, that uh, I'll be honest, pre COVID, I, I was scratching my head to, to try and understand how on earth are we going to get the industry wide traction we need on on this. And, and yes, I think we have proven that we can do this. And um, what we mustn't do is drop the, the the tempo. I'm not saying that we need to carry on with daily sessions involving 12 industry leaders or, or, or more. Um, but what we can't do is go back to two monthly uh, meetings um, w w without making a lot of progress. So we've got we've got to take the positives that have come out of this. Um, some of the materials tracking, I think, is is, is here to stay. Even just the the heartbeat of the industry, what's going on, what what's production, what what's what capacity is happening, uh, a, just a basic level of communication, I think, is here to stay. Um, but you know, if, if this economy, if this country needed uh, the the uh, upscaling and improvement in our ambitions for for infrastructure for society, that was important beforehand. It's it's only going to be even more important now <clears throat> and it's all very well uh, earlier this year talking about uh, sector deal two and you know people talk about the automotive aerospace and you know billion level uh, injections to modernize an industry and 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 fine that that all makes sense but it was never going to be that easy to wander up to government and say um we need a couple of billion quid and we can sort the industry out um because you know, that, that money wasn't going to be lying around and there's even less of it going to be lying around now. So uh, it's it's added a, um, the, certainly an, in, an, in, an increased requirement, but also for for that, we really, it's easy to come up with strap lines like, you know, we've got to do more for less, but but we, we quite simply have. Uh, and that really does mean challenging a whole bunch of, uh, of what we've done um, everything from design standards to, to planning approach to procurement approach, a um, whole raft of things need to change, always did, um, just more so now. Um, but that's where we are. And I, and I think it's actually quite exciting, uh, the opportunities that we have to build, to build on this. So, yeah, th things have changed, uh, a whole bunch of things um, we must maintain in terms of momentum and commitment. Uh, and there's a really exciting um, path ahead of us, which um, I think has actually been helped by the responses that we've seen in the past two months. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. That's good. And it is, they like say, you know, positive sort of looking forward almost if we can roll these ways of working into um, affecting mm -hmm. industry change, it might supercharge what the CLC was <laughs> aiming to do before. So that's yeah. Really, yeah. Helpful. Right, Alistair, I've got a question for you on margins. Um, so this is, in, I think it's just targeting um, contractors, but how can we use the recovery to build a more sustainable 
industry with better margins and you know longer term investment more investment in r d and skills and training and development i mean i know you were thinking about that um before before we came into the pandemic but what's your what's your thoughts now on how to embed that that work um and what how you see it playing out during the recovery phase well, yeah, I mean, certainly the context of this is the last year for which I've got data for my members, their average margin was 0.76%, which doesn't feel very sustainable. Um, so even before uh, we had this crisis, um, this was an issue, as you as you articulate. Um, I think right now, margins almost is behind a few other issues that we need to address. Frankly, we need to get the cash flow through the business first. Uh, before looking at the margins, but all of the broader industry change that we're talking about here, why on earth would we change an industry and retain uh, a, a, a sense that it's possible to operate at that level of margin? I would assume that these things are bound up in the same reform, that we move to a model whereby we deliver outstanding outcomes for our customers, and in doing so, get a reasonable return that allows businesses to reinvest uh, in their work uh, in, a, in a more effective way, and therefore over time consistently improve that ability to deliver. Um, as I say, it feels like those things are wrapped up. Um, if I'm being really, really honest though, right now, the main thing for me is ensuring that there are businesses to improve, to improve the margins of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really challenging, isn't it, to have that sort of short term, you know, uh, make sure your hair's not on fire, <laughs> put your hair out, um, versus the, you know, uh, resetting to, to get to a, a, a bigger, more sustainable industry. But yeah, I've, uh, I definitely feel your, feel your pain there in the, the same sort of uh, mindset for, for some of the consultancies. Okay, brilliant. Right, we've got lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to move us very swiftly on. So, um, so Andy, we've got uh, some bit of a sort of follow up question there, I guess um to what we were just talking about with Alistair around sustainable businesses um but what's the CLC's view on the need for procurement models to change fundamentally for you know to be to make the businesses more sustainable and the clients more collaborative in the long term now again I think this was on your agenda before but perhaps you wanted to um just highlight really whether you know the procuring for value work is, is going to be in the recovery program it's going to be part of that well, it has to be. I mean, as Alistair said, it, you look at any, you, you look at the high-level stats uh, of, of this industry and the performance of the operators in it, and it doesn't make sense. And it hasn't made sense for quite some time. And you know, I've I've always said it's taken us thirty or forty years of just refining the ability to buy on cost uh, and and cheapest, the lowest upfront cost. And we've turned that into a fine art, and it's got us to where we are. And uh, I think the next, uh, the next, the coming months are going to show just how fragile this industry is. Uh, and if anyone ever needed convincing that things had to change, I think the next few months are going to you know, make that even more clear. So uh, it has to change. Uh, you know, we've always recognised on almost non-existent margins. How can you invest in R and D? How can you invest in training and upskilling and uh, new sets of skills and all, all, all the rest of it. It, it. it is just not feasible. It's what the Project 13 piece was was um, about, that we have to change how the industry works. Uh, it, that has to be a part of all the other things we're talking about. Um, otherwise, it's just not going to happen. So again, I think this has put a, a, a very um, useful spotlight on, on the things that need changing and how we go about buying um, buying outcomes and, and understanding true uh, whole life value versus what's the cheapest thing I could buy now. Um, that that's that's got to that's got to change. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. I mean, like I said it's it, it's. I think it was brilliant that CLC had identified that, and I would hope that through the recovery we can really start to sort of speed mm -hmm. up that change in how it's embedded because, as you say, it's going to become very acute for a, a lot of businesses that current model is, is not sustainable over the next couple of months. And, you know, I think the so the Project 13 piece, um, yes, born in the sort of the economic infrastructure client space. And I think what's really helpful as we uh, look at the industry in, in these different sectors, 
what that means for economic infrastructure that you know the, the big construction projects and that kind of stuff that's one thing but what does that mean in housing what does that mean uh in in social uh infrastructure what does that mean in the private sector um you've really got to break it down into those areas um because the the approaches and the steps towards a better future are different in each of them so really important that we get that uh, the clarity on those sectors and then as i say start answering all of these questions against all of these sectors and understanding what we've got to do to affect change mm -hmm. no and i think that would be um <clears throat> something that we could you know it, it's, it's in there it's funded as part of the sector deal so actually you know you think mm -hmm. on the face of it that would be a, a simpler um one to to accelerate and, and start to, to get that thinking uh, and that approach developed yeah okay I've got a question on um, skills. So this is from uh, somebody saying, I'm a small consulting engineer in, in need of additional staff. Can you explain more about the loans of staff and who might be good to talk to about that? So certainly, so um, I will ask this question of myself. <laughs> um, so this is something which uh, came up in looking at the furloughing and recognizing that when you bring people back in, if there's no furlough scheme, you might have surplus staff while you're building your pipeline of work back up or you know, for example, if you're an engineering firm and you're, you know, been focused very much on, on private sector uh, retail developments, for example, you're probably quite quiet at the moment. But equally, just down the road, you might have another consulting engineer working on data centres uh, who is rushed off their feet. So this came out of that concept that actually um, what we need to do is to um, create this talent retention scheme that helps us on a you know on a loan basis or on a permanent basis sort the expertise so that we retain these individuals uh, within the industry so at the moment it's something that we are scoping um, so we are working out the you know how that system would work uh, with a view to trying to get it um, up and running very shortly um, it may be quite rudimentary to start with I've got to be honest um, but that's exactly what we're, we're scaping about. So if you're interested in, in being a part of that, interested in you know, helping us just design how that works and, and some of the sort of boundaries around it, then please do um, get in touch with me because we think it's something that's going to be quite critical to us retaining um, some of these really highly skilled people that we have in the industry um, rather than making them redundant and then perhaps losing them forever out of an industry that in one part or another does need them. So yeah, please keep in, in touch with me about that and I would welcome some, some input in helping to shape it to make sure that it works for businesses. Okay, um, so there are a couple of questions now around um accelerating developments and relaxation of the um the planning rules so i think this might be just an interesting one for us to, to sort of have a discussion on between the three of us but you know there are some um questions coming through and i'll roll them up into one around how do we accelerate um construction accelerate works but do it in such a way that we're not contravening planning or we're not ending up with a lot of white elephants it would be quite easy uh, i think to, to accelerate things uh, into the you know into the sort of delivery pipeline um, that perhaps then we you know we regret in future because we don't fully understand how people are going to use them so how do we what's our thoughts on how we might guard against that so if I come to you first Alistair um, just thinking about that that as a risk perhaps to recovery so um, I think clearly um, our members are looking at the pipeline and anything that can be done to bring work forward will be beneficial to them. I think there are sort of three fundamental barriers to that. Um, one is, as you mentioned, the planning side of things. One is the funding uh, available and one is almost the, the back office resources needed to process uh, the, these projects. So from the planning point of view, I think we, what we absolutely mustn't do is try and override the sort of democratic ability of people to comment on uh, planning in their area. Um, but if we could find ways to do so more efficiently, why on earth wouldn't we want to do that? I think what's been interesting is we have seen moves in that direction that probably wouldn't have happened were it not for uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, funding is another big issue, and that's not necessarily just funding for existing schemes, like for new schemes. It's let's say I'm a local authority and I've had a project in my pipeline that was costed at 10 million. Is it still going to cost 10 million now, given that we're going to have to have um, different approaches to social distancing on site? 
So it may be that um, particularly public sector clients need a little bit of pump priming to get uh, schemes that are sitting uh, near market in the pipeline to be viable. Um, and the final one's about around resources. And I think this is where industry can help itself. If we have um, customers that are struggling to process uh, schemes through their pipeline for any reason, it's in our interest to help them. Um, so if we can be seconding in, probably on quite a limited basis uh, to help with that, it, it's, a, it's a mutually beneficial approach, I would suggest. Okay, no, it's just interesting you say to, you know, it's it's not as simple as relaxing the planning laws and then everything's going to come in whooshing through, so to speak. And what are your thoughts on that as a risk? I mean, in terms of the um, engagement with government, Andy, obviously that is it's quite a tight rope to, to walk between, you know, championing sector recovery and, and making sure what we deliver is the right stuff for society and the right stuff for government. Oh, I think we're right. There we go. Sorry, I'm I'm un, I'm unmuted now. That's really good. Um, yeah, it, I think the the point there of providing solutions. I mean, so we're talking about uh, accelerating developments, the, the, all the planning issues, and and all of that. Um, the thing that I think we, we we've seen quite a lot of is that um, these issues are not unique to one agency uh, or one geography or whatever, and. And I think there's a role that we could certainly uh, play in trying to to recognise what's working in one area and and gathering that. And so our market intelligence as an industry uh, and being able to make that available to others um, in terms of sharing best practice. And I think that's part of this industry becoming a solution provider. Um, and I, and I think the same goes for for the whole pricing funding piece. How, yes, how on earth are you supposed to at the moment go tender uh, for construction works when you've got no idea what productivity you're going to get? And okay, so you can sit there and say, well, then there's nothing we can do, or or you know we do. There is a work stream with, with the CLC task force on 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 a, it's a cost review is what it's being described, but it's trying to put some metrics and some sense around. What does cost and cost efficiency mean now, and how how can you procure with the backdrop that that we have? And and again, I think the industry's got a role in in offering solutions up. Uh, if we sit here waiting for people to say, "Well, that's all fine. Let's get back to normal," that ain't going to happen. So um, I I think there's there's a lot of important work in here, and I can see where actually you know, between. Uh, the, the likes of Seeker and, and ACE and, and, and Build UK, um, there, there's a lot, I think, that we know that we could uh, marshal in the right way uh, and, and help provide, uh, as I say, some, some of the, the, the clients and these agencies with, with help in doing what they know they want to do. So, um, yeah, we, more solution providing, more market intelligence, more intelligent collating and then helping share, I, I think has got to be a, a really important part of this. Mm -hmm. No, I really like that. I, I'm going to I'm going to have that as a phrase, Andy. Uh, solution providers, because that's it. I mean, and that's that's the safeguard for us in terms of not cutting mm -hmm. across the you know the sort of democratic leaders or the clients who understand their priorities. Our role is to is to help them find the right solutions to those problems. Um, and that might mean, as Alison said, sort of reshaping certain schemes that could be, you know, at a sort of uh, city leader level, that could be modelling and demonstrating the, you know, the robustness of the strategic plan so that when they come to um, the planning process, they're confident they're approving the right things. I think that's, yeah, I like that. Solution providers. There we go. That should be our, our tagline for the recovery programme. <laughs> but I, I think it is. And, and you know, we can sit here saying, well, I'm a designer, I'm a constructor or, or fine which is a way of looking at life but that that isn't really what people want they want help with solutions and and, and the questions and the, the, you know, the environment the backdrop that we've got now is confusing and it's new um and i think the more imaginative the more creative we are and the more we understand the issues that our clients uh have uh, the more useful we can be and the, i think this is all part of the transforming the business model in, into into solutions and, and looking to the future and helping people with pathways there. Brilliant. Okay. 
No, thank you very much, Andy. Um, right, one final question, and it's a good one to, to finish on, um, which is around um, skills and apprenticeships specifically. Um, so this is somebody who's concerned that apprenticeships um, aren't scaled down, on you know, apprentices aren't dropped, and actually how can we look to scale it up and welcome diverse people who might be changing careers, perhaps from other sectors where there's less employment, um, into construction. So what's the what's the role of the recovery plan in, in supporting that? So um, Alistair, do you want to just say a few words um, from your perspective on that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because actually our experience from the global financial crisis was that the number of apprenticeships did dip initially, but actually grew through the crisis because people did recognise that there's going to be something coming down the line that we need to get ready for. So it would be nice to think that that would be repeated this time, that we wouldn't see uh, a significant fall off uh, in apprentices. However, what I would say is that while the government has done a lot of work on policy in this area, the apprenticeship system as it stands probably doesn't work as effectively as it could. Um, and there's a bit of tin pot around it, loads of little schemes to try and get a few apprentices here and a few apprentices there. I kind of feel we're in the world where if we are going to deliver an infrastructure revolution, we should probably work collectively to understand what the apprenticeships we need are and go out there and recruit en masse, almost as a, a sort of a campaign to create a generation of people that are going to overhaul the infrastructure of this country. Um, and I want that to be an exciting sell to say, you know, you can be part of the, the sort of recovery from coronavirus and, and building a, a better Britain, which all sounds a bit jingoistic. Um, but no, I, I think there, there's, there's really something that as an industry, if we work collectively, we could do something fantastic. And also, given that we're looking at what, 800,000 extra unemployed next year, um, it, then there's a huge talent pool that we could be tapping into to support us, given that we've historically struggled to get the skills that we need as an industry. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I think, I think it sounds passionate, Alistair, not jingoistic. I, you know, I like that. <laughs> okay, Andy, just a, a sort of final comment from yourself on this in relation to the CLC's priorities and the, the overarching well, plan. You, you, you know, we, we, we've said for some while that if you look at what we've got to achieve in this industry, um, and whether we talk about that is you know, really um, taking digital and data capabilities for what they could be, and, 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 and the things of the future, the sort of robotics, the AI capability and all the rest of it. And if you look at uh, the safer building uh, challenges that we have and what we've got to achieve there. And if you look at net zero, there are these are really, really important and exciting issues, certainly for a younger generation. And um, our challenge, which I think has just become even more clear, is that we've got to sell this industry. I totally agree with Alistair. Uh, we've got we on uh, mass as a collective, as an industry, we need to be explaining what it is we we can do and must do and will do for society and um <clears throat> so that you know we, we, the, the infrastructure revolution is a better title than a recovery plan i think we we know what we meant when we said recovery plan but that doesn't that's not uh that's not exciting enough um so i, I think uh as we shape this together in the coming weeks and months we mustn't worry about sounding a bit uh a, a bit um uh, imaginative or whatever. This is a really, really uh, big opportunity, and we we should be glamming it up. We should be explaining ourselves uh, uh, and explaining to other new entrants why this is such a fascinating uh, industry to be in, and, and a brilliant time. It it's a really exciting story. We've just got to make sure that we don't describe it too engineering. Uh, maybe we need a bit more marketing in all of that. And there we go. I think that's it. Yeah, maybe that's the skill set we need to attract in <laughs> market our solutions to the clients. But no, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we're I'm in this industry because it makes a difference, and I'm sure there will be a lot more people who would like to be or would be attracted to be in it um, if we could convey that message. So. Yep. Right.
We're out of time. Brilliant. We haven't quite got through all the questions, but I will do my best to um, collect those up and come back to you uh, separately. So apologies if you asked your question, we didn't quite get to it. Um, just to close out, thank you very much um, for everybody that contributed. Thank you to my brilliant panellists. Uh, this isn't going to be the last time that we talk about this recovery, I'm sure, um, but just useful I think to you know very timely to, to have your thoughts today so thank you for both taking the, the time out of your busy schedules to to join us and thank you all to, to everybody who participated and asked the questions so you know we've had a quite a few of you on there hundreds of you on in fact today on the webinar so thank you very much and if you enjoyed it if you want to share it um, it will be recorded and put up on our website so please do it's open for, for everybody to enjoy and thank you again for, for my panelists and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.